When taking the department's computer-aided design course, you should have been exposed to the formal design process. This lecture is intended to review that process so that you can apply it to the design project in this class. To quickly review, engineering design is the process of devising a system, component, or process to meet desired needs. Key elements of this process include establishment of objectives and criteria, synthesis, analysis, construction, testing, and evaluation. Objectives clearly state the purpose or goals of the intended design work. In this class, the objective is to provide an educational experience that equips you well for the transition to industry. Criteria clearly state the standards used to evaluate your work. A familiar example of criteria might be the grading rubric used to evaluate your performance in any class that you take. Synthesis and analysis are pretty interesting because they look pretty similar on the surface. However, investigating their definitions reveals they are antonyms. We should all be quite familiar with the concept of analysis because it is separating any entity into its smallest constituent elements, which is exactly what we learned to do in most of the engineering courses we've taken thus far. Synthesis, on the other hand, is exactly the opposite. It's combining small elements of separate entities into something greater or something unified to perform a desired function. Construction, testing, and evaluation should be self-explanatory. In this course, our focus will be mechanical design, which is equally important regardless of whether you're going the aerospace or mechanical engineering route. Mechanical design, by definition, refers to the design of components and systems of a mechanical nature. Machines, products, structures, devices, and instruments. That pretty much covers everything from appliances to aircraft. As noted in the Shigley design text, when engaging in mechanical design, we use math, science, and our materials understanding, as well as the ability to communicate graphically and verbally to express our ideas to our coworkers or clients. Continuing with our academic analogy, the need may be to apply the design process to a real-world problem so that we can be confident in our ability to do so upon transitioning to industry. The example provided in the CAD course is that there is too much damage to bumpers in low-speed collisions. Note recognizing the need is typically a general statement that doesn't comment on the design approach to the problem. For example, it doesn't say the bumper should be stronger or more flexible or that bumper heights should be more closely regulated by the Department of Transportation. The second step of the design process is problem definition. This is one of the most critical steps of the design process because it is more specific than simply recognizing the need. The problem definition must include all specifications for what we are designing. Anything that limits our freedom of choice as a designer is a specification. As noted, it is imperative to write a formal problem statement which expresses exactly what the design is to accomplish. This statement will include objectives and goals. In other words, the project or design must be capable of doing this, must not do that as well as preferences as far as what the customer would like it to do and what they don't want it to do, and constraints imposed upon us as far as our design is concerned. This might include a time constraint, budget constraint, etc. And finally, perhaps most importantly, the criteria which will be used to evaluate the effectiveness of our design. The example problem statement provided in the notes details a remotely controlled mobile vehicle which must be able to operate in an indoor environment and accomplish several things. The first goal is for it to be able to travel up to a speed of 7 feet per second on a flat, horizontal, dry, bare concrete surface. As engineers, we like this first objective because it contains quantitative data. We can replicate the environment the surface and the friction coefficient and we can measure the velocity using a calibrated instrument. The second goal of the mobile vehicle design is for it to be able to climb 5 inch high stairs at speeds up to 2 feet per second. At first glance this objective also has concrete quantitative data 
However, there are several items missing which are imperative in order to evaluate how well we meet this objective. We're given no information regarding the geometry of the stairs other than their height. For instance, how deep are the stairs? What surface are they made of? Are they covered? Are they painted? Are they wet or are they dry? In addition, the velocity specification is not clearly defined. Is the two feet per second in relation to a flat horizontal surface or is it a vector measured along the path of the stairs? The third objective of the mobile vehicle problem statement is that the device is able to carry a payload of at least 20 pounds. From an engineering perspective, there are at least two problems with this objective. Can you identify them? The first problem is there is no limit to the payload capacity. Does that mean 30 pounds is the maximum, or 300 pounds, or 3,000 pounds? In addition, this objective provides no information regarding the size or even the phase of the payload. Therefore, this is another poorly written objective which requires clarification before proceeding with the project. The fourth and final objective I'll discuss in these notes is that the mobile vehicle must be able to fit through doorways. After reading this objective, it should be very clear that we've encountered another vague, poorly written one that is going to require clarification since doorways are available in a variety of sizes ranging from tiny doggy doors all the way up to aircraft hangar doors large enough to drive a 777 cargo aircraft through. The bottom of page 5 presents a list of common design considerations that are relevant when working on many design problems. The third step in the design process is information gathering, also known as background research. As noted, there is often either no information easily found or an abundance of information on the topics of interest. Background research is a never-ending process for the best design engineers because they're constantly surveying their environment, adding to the mental database of ideas they have to pull from on their next design project. Common sources for background information include textbooks, magazines, technical reports, company catalogs and websites, as well as patent searches. A generally underutilized resource, however, is people. After performing basic research on a topic, one of the best ways to solidify your understanding is to contact a company that specializes in that area of interest and speak to an applications engineer. Coworkers can often provide valuable information as well, however, make sure that you research the topic before just asking a coworker for the answer so you don't develop a reputation as someone who is lazy or incapable of performing their own background research. Finally, let's discuss some common problems when gathering information. The first problem is laziness, and this is one that plagues all of us. Due to how powerful the internet is for information gathering, if a keyword search doesn't return the answer as one of the top hits, it's easy to conclude the information doesn't exist. We have to summon the discipline to push beyond that and realize there's many other ways to find information as discussed earlier in this section. The second major problem in gathering information is how accurate and credible is the information we're gathering. Realizing most companies exist to make money and their salespeople are pretty much programmed to tell every customer that their product is of course better than their competitors, it's important to learn to separate the marketing or advertising information from the technical specifications that we can hold a company responsible for in regard to the performance of their product. The last potential landmine when gathering information is in regard to plagiarism. If you find an idea and use it or share it with someone else without giving the original author or creator the credit they deserve, you are essentially stealing their idea by implicitly taking the credit for it. If you do this in the classroom, then you'll go before the honor court. If, however, you do this in industry, then you will lose any reputation of integrity that you may have had previously, and it is not a mistake from which you will likely recover. So always give others credit for their ideas. Your reward as a design engineer will come from taking others' ideas and synthesizing them into new solutions. The fourth step in the design process is concept generation. As noted, this is one of the most creative parts of the design process, and in turn, one that many enjoy the most. There are many ways to approach this exercise. Adaptation, for example, is applying a solution to a problem in one field to a new application. The example provided is a printing press, which required an ergonomic handle for the operator. So instead of coming up with a new idea, they adapted one that was used centuries earlier in the production of wine. 
Area thinking is another common example of concept generation. We find this method applied to most of the consumer items around us, ranging from automobiles to electronic devices like cell phones and laptops. Apple, for example, does not come out with a radically new iPhone every year, but rather they focus on area improvements to the base architecture carried over from the previous model. Brainstorming is probably the most common example of concept generation, and one that you will use countless times throughout your careers as engineers in industry. As explained in the notes, there are several other methods of concept generation which work quite effectively depending on the project and the designer's personality. The fifth, and arguably most important step of the design process, is concept selection. At this point, the design team typically has several ideas that have been investigated, and they have to select the idea or ideas on which to focus the team's resources. The most common method of concept selection used in industry is to form a decision matrix to unbiasedly evaluate the different concepts based on a weighted set of objectives the design team decides are important for solving the problem. The course notes provide a decision matrix example for the design of a crane hook. Let's examine this example to understand the key components to a properly created decision matrix. We begin by selecting the objectives that are important for the design concepts under evaluation. For each selected objective, we next assign weighting factors based on how important each objective is to the overall success of the design. In this example, reliability has the highest weighting factor because if the crane hook fails, people can be killed or cargo can be destroyed. Notice all the weighting factors must sum to 1 or 100%. The parameter column lists the units for each objective. There are quantitative parameters such as cost, time, and speed, and there are qualitative objectives such as reliability, repairability, and controllability. Quantitative objectives can be quantified by calculating a value from an equation, whereas qualitative objectives are assigned values based on the relative comparison of different design concepts. For EML 2322, if an objective can be assessed quantitatively, you must always do so. The evaluation matrix contains one column for each design under consideration. Our crane hook example compares three methods of manufacturing a crane hook. The first method is to weld plates together to create the hook. The second method is to rivet plates together to create the hook. And the third method is to cast molten metal to create the hook. Note each concept being compared has three subcolumns: magnitude, score, and value. Magnitude refers to the value of the objective being evaluated. In the case of our crane hook example, the magnitude of the material costs for the three designs under consideration are $2,500, $2,500, and $2,200, respectively. For this particular objective, the lowest magnitude is obviously the best design. Therefore, the cast hook with a magnitude of $2,200 receives the highest score of 10 points out of a possible 10 points. We then use a linear relationship to compute the scores for the other concepts. Since they both have the same magnitude of $2,500, their scores are computed as $2,200 divided by $2,500 times the 10 score that was awarded the best design, which went to the cast hook. It should now be apparent that the score is the relative comparison of the different magnitudes. If, for example, the cost of one concept is twice as much as another, the more expensive concept would receive half the score of the cheaper one. The third and final subcolumn contains the value, which is simply each concept's magnitude times its assigned or computed score. And finally, the overall value for each concept in the matrix is simply the summation of the individual value computations for each concept. Once the decision matrix is complete, the winning concept is the design which receives the highest overall value since it's the one that was proven to best meet the selected and weighted objectives. 
This part of the design process requires a lot of work because of the extensive justification data which has to accompany each value reported in the decision matrix. If you can't support the values reported in the evaluation matrices with solid justification data, you'll quickly lose credibility as a design engineer. The sixth step of the design process is communication of the design. Since the purpose of the design is to satisfy the needs of the client, the designer must provide oral, written, and graphical updates. As noted, many great designs and inventions have been lost simply because the originator was unable or unwilling to explain his or her accomplishments to others. Step 7 of the design process is the detailed design and analysis. As explained in the notes, this is the whole reason we study engineering courses. If we've gotten this far and don't enjoy using science and math to analyze real-world phenomena, we've probably made a mistake in our career path. Note the designer's time investment typically increases exponentially with regard to the accuracy of the analysis he or she is performing. In concluding our review of the design process are steps 8, 9, and 10 prototype development and testing, manufacturing, and life cycle maintenance. The design and manufacturing laboratory provides the initial exposure to prototype development and testing. Your manufacturing class examines the physics behind manufacturing. And life cycle maintenance is typically learned on the job working in industry. This has been a quick review of the design process introduced previously in our curriculum. Please review the notes thoroughly and ask any questions you have about the process prior to completing the design reports in the course or applying this process in industry. Thank you.